Hi everyone, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. And welcome to today's event, Anti-Blackness in the Latin XAO Community, a community conversation with the NASPA Latin XAO Knowledge Community and the ACPA Latinx Network. My name is Dr. Martha Enciso, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I currently serve as one of the co-chairs for the NASPA Latinx AO Knowledge Community, or LKC for short. Joining me later today will be Dr. Delmi Lendoff, who also serves as co-chair of the NASPA LKC. We wanted to take a few minutes to recognize the importance of today's date. Juneteenth signifies the emancipation of the last remaining enslaved African Americans in the United States. It is a significant day in the movement for Black freedom. While many in the Black community celebrate this day with great joy, it is also an opportunity for white and non-Black people of color to recommit ourselves to anti-racism, unlearning anti-Blackness, and confronting racial violence that continues today. June is also Pride Month, an important time to provide visibility and affirmation to the members of our LGBTQ plus community. As some may know, the Stonewall riots, which occurred in June 1969, were a direct response to police raids. Led by Black members of the LGBTQ plus community, like Marsha P. Johnson, the riots were a significant event in the gay liberation movement. Today, we affirm that all Black lives matter, and we commit ourselves to actions consistent with this stance. We would also like to acknowledge the land across Turtle Island, North America, on which we stand as the traditional land of indigenous peoples. We believe that historical awareness of indigenous exclusion and erasure is critically important. Please take a moment to honor the ancestral grounds you're inhabiting now and celebrate the resilience and strength that all indigenous people have shown worldwide. As a community, we are committed to working to overcome the effects of this exclusion and erasure in our own educational institutions. man and for me oh thank you for the notice on recording um for me that's really important to mention because i really attribute and nod a lot of my own exploration with blackness thanks to my husband and his family now my family and what else i mentioned my role and i guess a little bit about my ties to this topic and work is that it's very much influenced in my own personal journey with learning about my own blackness and afro latinidad so this work for me is coming more from a personal lens and more recently, I think infusing it in informal and formal ways through my work. Um, tying it to higher education. And I think more recently, I've really been focusing on the spiritual healing and celebratory components of my blackness. I think there's a lot of pain in the world and my heart and spirit can only take so much. So for me, black liberation is also rooted in joy celebration. So I share that with you all in transparency and I very much look forward to unlearning, learning, and remembering through today's conversation, but as well as moving forward. I'm going to pass it on to my colleague Luis now to introduce himself. Hello, mi gente. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, depending on the time zone. Um, the name is Luis, as you see in the slides. I use he, him, his pronouns. And as far as my position uh, in the field, I'm the Assistant Director for Civic Engagement uh, with the Office of Civic Engagement and Social Responsibility at Towson University. Uh, and for those who don't know about Towson University, it is located about 20 or so minutes north of uh, Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, so I'm locally in, in Maryland, I'm currently living about half an hour from the from DC. So I'm in the uh, DC metropolitan area while living, uh, where I currently live with my wife. Um, I am a proud black Latino or Afro Latino by way of Puerto Rico and Dominican Republic. Um, I was also born in Bayamón, Puerto Rico. So it's pretty, you know, not you know so it's a it's a, it's good to see uh it's, it's good to be representing here uh where i also lived and i lived in toalta puerto rico as well before moving to monte Cristi, dominican republic uh which is where my, my mom's side of the family is the dominican side uh and when it comes to my outward at least the outward blackness of mine it comes more so from my mom's side of the family than my father's um, I then, um, we, my, my immediate family and I then moved to Miami, Florida, where I lived for 13 years. Um, so I went, you know, I'm a product of, uh, most of my schooling was, uh, public up until undergrad where I attended the University of Miami. So go Kings. Um, and then I went to grad school, uh, F, uh Florida International University. So go Panthers. Uh, and that's where I got my higher education administration degree. Um, so I took all that and when I started in the field, it started actually 
uh, in South Carolina, uh, where I lived for three years, working at the University of South Carolina in their Leadership and Service Center. And then after those three years there, uh, which informed a lot of, especially how, um, how I, my journey with, black, with, with blackness happened in, in many ways, in, in different ways from the different places where I was. But um, that time in South Carolina definitely served as a big turning point for me, which I can expand on later when talking more about blackness and, and anti-blackness in higher education, um, to then come here to, um, to Maryland to work at Towson University. Um, currently married to a black American and Korean woman. Um, so that's another part of what informs my journey within my own blackness as we both explore our blackness together. Um, and, you know, and from there, being able to use all this and apply it and tie it into my current work in civic engagement efforts, in supporting our students. And as you can see with the, what we're facing today, um, our black students, both Latinx and non-Latinx students need to truly continue to be supported and empowered during this time. So my lens comes from very personal experiences as I authentically navigate within my own blackness and then um, support our students um, and especially um, our black Latinx students to do the same and in supporting black students in general, in addition to the work that I do with uh, in civic engagement efforts with all of our students um, uh, on, on our campus. So it's something that is um, really very important to me. So I'll then pass it on to Dr. Cece. Thank you. Um, my name is Dr. Cecilia Suarez, but I also go by Cece. Um, I'm an assistant professor currently at the University of Florida, focusing on intercultural communication and global leadership. Um, I also focus and embed my courses within the practice and praxis of um, critical race theory. So for me, that is the lens that I'm always looking at, even in my personal life, um, because it does not end when we exit the four walls of the institution. Um, I am a very proud first-generation college student who was raised by two strong uh, Mexican women. And so there is a lot to be said about how I embrace um, and connect with women of color in particular and really focus on making sure that they are incorporated into um, communication commu um, and in discussions. Um, I have been raised academically um, by strong black women. And for me, it is very important to continuously and constantly name uh, black women and black scholars within the work that I do as well as in the classes I teach as just one effort to uh, push against um, anti-blackness within society as a whole. Um, I went to the University of Miami for undergrad, which actually was my very first realization that I didn't know what I didn't know until I got somewhere outside of Texas. I'm originally from San Antonio, for me, I grew up in a all brown neighborhood that happened to be right next to the highway. And if we know, if highways split communities up um, for, for reasons that we will talk about later in this, um, in this panel, um, but I was um, on the end where kids played together no matter what color you were. Um, so for me, that was my um, only instance into people who were quote unquote, different for me, a different kind of brown, if you will, but when I went to Miami, it was my first time realizing that there were Latinos who are Black. Um, and it shocked me at first that people who I read as Black would speak Spanish. Um, and you can, you know, I can write a whole book about how that was um, a beautiful culture shock for me um, arriving in Miami. Um, but I am centering myself today on knowing that um, I am an expert of my own experience, which allows me to unpack the knowledge that I bring with me, but also allows me the opportunity to unpack um, and unlearn what I am uh, relearning today. Thank you. All right, good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Christopher Busey. I am an assistant professor um, in the critical studies of race, ethnicity, and culture at the University of Florida. I'm also affiliate faculty for the Center for Latin American Studies and for the African American Studies program um, at the University of Florida. I also received my undergraduate degree from UF a uh, long, long, long time ago. Mm -hmm. uh, born in Rochester, New York, upstate New York. 
uh, paid rent in Savannah, Georgia, Orlando, Florida, Austin, Texas, and now back in Gainesville, Florida. Um, I come into this work largely out of concern for black life. Um, my work centers black life and the dehumanization of black life, primarily in educational spaces. Um, I think when we have, uh, when we talk about black life, we have a responsibility to also uh, center black life hemispherically, right, and globally, um, and understanding that uh, many of the issues that we are seeing today are common throughout the African diaspora and the Americas, right? And this includes Latin America, the US, the Caribbean, um, and so on. And I'll be speaking to those things um, a bit later. But um, a, a, another entry point for me too has been my experience as a K-12 educator working in um, African diasporic communities um, in Central Florida, primarily uh, working with Afro Dominican, um, Afro Boricua youth, um, engaging with youth, and learning what it means to be an advocate for Black life um, and for Black youth who occupy multiple positionalities, who have multiple positionalities. And one of the things that um, I have encountered in my experiences, not only as an educator, but um, just living every day in Central Florida were the experiences um, of racial discrimination that a lot of Afro-Latinx youth had in schools and communities um, that were really dehumanizing and, and resulted in material impacts for those students being ushered into special ed programs, um, as opposed to AP courses and so on. And again, I'll be highlighting some of these things um, as I talk a little bit later. But that's sort of my, my, my entry into uh, this conversation today. And I'm thankful uh, to the panelists for this invite. And I look forward to engaging in, in, in conversation and Q&A with the attendees. Thank you. Can we have the next slide, please? All right. We're just going to frame the conversation a little bit today to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, actually, before I do that, I want to give a little shout out to my colleagues at Yale who made me realize something literally five minutes before this panel about Juneteenth that I wanted to add to the conversation. And I'll read it here that it says the Mascogos in Mexico still celebrate Juneteenth as well. They came from the Black Seminoles, uh, which are native people from Florida and Oklahoma, and escaped to freedom by traveling to Coahuila. I apologize if I mispronounced that. A lot of people don't realize that the Underground Railroad didn't just go to Canada in the north. And lots of folks have faked uh, U.S. slavery by going to Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean. Um, I also, at the same time, want to frame this, that this does not negate anti-Blackness in Latin America. I think we hear that a lot, uh, especially when it comes to, like, um, freed or unfreed African slaves or enslaved Africans, I should say, going to Mexico. But I think it's really important for us to highlight how our histories are intrinsically tied to one another and continuing to emphasize why this topic today is so important. So with that, I want to name that we are here to center Blackness and validate intersections with, uh, with Latin American peoples as well as Latinx peoples in the United States. Uh, a part of this means that we're going to be learning from the scholarship uh, and lived experiences of Black and Afro-Latinx peoples. And we're not necessarily here to debate the validity of them, but as much as share our experiences, perspectives, scholarship, and engage in dialogue with one another. We will go over some history, some terms, some theory. There's going to be a lot to unpack here. I think I realize even in preparing today how much there is to unpack. So we have less than 90 minutes and we can't promise that we're going to get through everything. But at the very least, we are very much hoping to plant the necessary seeds to move beyond conversation. Because I also recognize that we've had this conversation many, many a times. And it seems like every so often we're restarting the conversation. And so I'm really hoping that we can move more into actions unlearning behaviors and changing the structures that are influencing uh, our world today. Uh, and what else? Do, do, do. And that is about everything I had. Do my fellow panelists or moderators want to like add anything to the framing or are we good to go? And just show me a thumb, that's cool too. I see a thumb and a nod. It's all legal. I think Denmi's trying to speak, but she can't, she's muted. There we are. I think I'm, am, I, am I okay now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. My most sincere apologies that I was running from one meeting to the next. So um, my name is Delmi Lendov. I'm one of the co-chairs for the Latino Latinx knowledge community. 
And I am just so thankful to our panelists, to everyone who contributed to this idea. Um, this was an idea that came from our members. So I just want to acknowledge Connie, Letty, Ma uh, Maria, everyone who share ideas and thoughts about this event. Thank you all so, so much. Um, and then our panelists that were able to jump on board with a very quick turnaround time. So I just wanna say thank you to all of you. I think this topic is so relevant that in less than a week, um, because it's been less than a week since we started promoting it, we had over a thousand people register for this event. We actually had more than 1100 people register. As I speak, there are 791 people currently on this webinar right now. So I just want to acknowledge the need for these kinds of spaces and conversations and thank all of you for the questions that you all send in. We did our best to try to group up those questions into themes. We've asked our panelists to try to speak to those questions and themes. The reality is we are not going to be able to get to every single question, but we do want you to keep the questions coming because we hope that this will become a series and that this is just the beginning. So your questions will definitely inform our future conversations and our panelists will do their best to get to as many of your questions as we can today. So keep the questions coming. Also, I wanna encourage all of you in the chat, if you have resources, add them on. We will um, be sharing the resources, the recording, anything that we have, we will be sharing with you. And last but not least, I just want to acknowledge that while our panelists are amazing, talented, knowledgeable um, individuals who have so much to contribute, and I do think there's an enormous amount of expertise, there's a difference between expertise and know-it-all. We have experts in the room, we don't know it all. Um, so our hope is to share the expertise that we have, but understand that we are still learning and we are learning with you. So again, if for whatever reason we don't get it right, forgive us, um, give us the grace because we hope to get it right and we are work in progress um, as we continue to move through this. So I just wanted to acknowledge that, that your contributions, if you are one of the 796 people that are currently on, we welcome your expertise and your knowledge as we continue to move forward and learning. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to our panelists who um, were given a couple of themes and then some of your themes to um, get our conversation started. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Denmi. Um, so with that, I'm going to continue framing this conversation a little bit by really empowering you. This is being recorded, so hopefully we can discuss later on how to access the recording. Take notes because there will be a lot of terms and histories and names and things mentioned. And so I really empower each of us to invest in our own learning and ourselves so we can conduct our own research at a reasonable pace and still being present with our conversation today. Um, so with that, a good amount of the questions did uh, want us to highlight some terminology. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time with that to at least highlight some terms for you all with some brief summaries. And I want to give a huge shout out to racialequitytools.org. That is a fantastic website that I found to kind of like give you a good glossary of what are the terms that are being used today, not specifically to Latinx identity, but racial equity. And then from there, you can learn about the authors that have contributed to that website. Um, so with that, I'm going to start by stating the plainest reminder that I start every school year with with my students is reminding them that Latinx is an ethnicity, not a race. And so with that, we have to remember that an ethnicity is a common nationality or shared cultural traditions. And Haywood reminds us that Latinidad is an ethnicity that comprises individuals of a multitude of races. And so for races, for Latinidad, often we only think about white, black, and indigenous, but I also want to highlight that there is a big Asian uh, diaspora that exists within the Latin American countries. And so acknowledging that you can also be Asian and Latinx and mixed race as I am and so on and so on. Um, with that piece, I also want to center that some of us identify as Afro-Latinx and some of us identify as Black Latinx. And so you'll hear at least for myself interchanging those terms sometimes, but that is respective to everybody's individual journey and as language continues to develop. Um, something else to highlight is that Black is a reminder that Black does not equal African American. And I mean that because I think a lot of times, especially within the Latinx community, is always centering the African American experience within the United States. Um, and then it negates Nigerian Americans or African immigrants or Caribbeans and et cetera, et cetera. So really think about how it is that you are speaking about black people and how are we changing or expanding that narrative more so within today's context. 
And I also want to name that Black is not interchangeable with people of color. It is absolutely okay and necessary to center Black experiences. And so be mindful of what it, issues it is that we're talking about throughout histories and who is getting named at that time. Okay, mas. There's levels to racism. Uh, so you'll hear internalized, horizontal, systemic, overt, covert. I really encourage you once again to look into how all of these things show up. Uh, specific to anti-Blackness, some terms that came up through the questions that we wanted to highlight are colorism. And so colorism is the prejudice of this or discrimination against individuals with dark skin tone, uh, typically among the same ethnic or racial group. So in the Latinx community, we often refer to colorism because we're within the same ethnic group and we're seeing examples of colorism. Blanqueamiento is kind of an example of that and blanqueamiento literally translates to a racial whitening. And that mostly happens when folks are encouraged to marry and um, pretty much like produce offspring uh, with a person that is lighter skin in order for your offspring themselves to be lighter skin. And that we often hear with mejorar la raza, which means improve the race. So essentially moving our communities to become lighter skin and closer to whiteness in order to be better. Um, another term that is related to that is pigmentocracy, which is essentially government by or social hierarchy uh, of those with certain skin tones. Um, and something related to that as well as caste systems, which I think we've heard throughout history, especially within Latin America. There's some really offensive terminology when it comes to uh, the caste systems in Latin America, specifically the word that highlights the hybrid offspring of a horse and a donkey. I don't want to say the term because I'm not trying to be offensive or trigger anyone. Uh, but really think about what words it is that we're using, where they come from, and what they mean. Um, and that term of the horse and donkey offspring specifically highlights somebody who is the product of a white parent and a black parent. So just think about that for a little bit. Um, mestizaje is something that we hear a lot, uh, especially when we're talking about the racialization of Latinidad. And that term by itself inherently has ties to mejorar la raza, or once again, improving the race. Uh, it really romanticizes Spanish colonization. It frames religion uh, as a civilizing agent without addressing the violence and the genocide and the rape that took place. I really think about, um, so my last name is Davila, my dad's other last name is Cepeda, and Cepeda has a really big reputation in Puerto Rico of like bomba and plena, which are Afro-Puerto Rican dances, as well as um, Santeria and Yoruba, which are religions that are really raised in uh, African heritage in Puerto Rico. And what I'm learning more recently in my own journey now is how much of Santeria or Yoruba uh, traditions were hidden within Catholic traditions in order for enslaved Africans within the Caribbean and Latin America to survive uh, their colonizers at the time. And so somebody was asking in the questions about how does religion play into this? And so that was an example that came to mind that I wanted to name here today. Uh, I do want to give a quick shout out to some colleagues, I learned a lot of this from a presentation that I went to at ACPA, um, and it was called the Resilitation of Latinidad. So shout out to Cueponi, Jose, and another Carolina who made this amazing presentation and contributed to my own knowledge of myself today. Um, and then anti-racism is a term that we're hearing a lot today. And I really want to clarify that anti-racism doesn't center I'm not racist, but it's really going beyond that to dismantle the systems that uphold racist structures today. Uh, that is credit to Ibram Kendi and literally has a book of how to be an anti-racist. Highly suggest that we all invest some time into looking into that. And with anti-racism, there's levels to this. And so something for me that came into mind as a resource for folks to look into is Deepa Ayer. I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly. She has a mapping our social change roles in the times of crisis um, framework. And if you Google that really quickly, and I'll try to put it in the chat once I'm done talking. It's basically an opportunity for you to go through the reflection guide and analyze what kind of roles it is that you all take when it comes to doing the work of anti-racism, solidarity, social justice, and all of these other conversations that we're trying to have today. That is a lot of words. So I'm gonna stop talking now and I'm gonna ask my colleagues, my doctoral colleagues here to take us through some history and theory. I think they need to be unmuted. So I'm gonna keep talking a little bit until they're unmuted because I'm gonna acknowledge we're not hosts. So that's why we can't mute and unmute ourselves. And so here we are. Do, do, do. <laughs> okay, one is unmuted, amazing. All right, cool. Um, 
Yeah, so what I wanted to do was to provide a, a little bit of uh, theoretical as well as historical context for this conversation. You also, I also have to be clear, right? This is, a, this, this is an entire program of study and I am unable to unpack all of this in the five to 10 minutes that I was given um, uh, to do so. But I, I believe in citational practices, right? And I believe in citational practices both in my writing um, as well as in uh, discursive and dialogic spaces as such. And so I think it's important to recognize the work that Black scholars, especially uh, Black Latino scholars are doing. Um, I encourage everyone to check out the work of uh, the Black Latinos Know Collective uh, because they've been getting at a lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about uh, today, um, in particular as it pertains to higher education and student affairs. If you look at the work of Jasmine Haywood um, and Amalia Dache, they've been unpacking this stuff. So um, I, I, I want to be clear about the need to to not just cite their work, but also engage with their work, right? Because those, those constitute two different things. But I also think it's important to, to recognize that uh, we have scholars who are not in the academy as well, who are doing this work, right? So we look at La Cole in, in, in Puerto Rico. Um, you look at um, Black feminist organizations uh, across the Americas who are engaged in work regarding uh, anti-blackness in U.S. Latinx communities, as well as anti-blackness in Latin America. Um, so I want to be clear that how I'm defining scholars in this case um, is, is broadly defined to be inclusive of, of the folk who are doing the work and practice, right? Um, I think one, I, I guess if I had to focus on, on, on one thing in particular, would be the ways in which um, the scholars engage with this work and, and I'm engaged in this work in, in education as well uh, that is important to, to, to kind of highlight today is how this discussion is situated hemispherically and transnationally, right? And what this means to look at these issues um, across the African diaspora in the America. And I'm going to go back and forth to my notes and, and, and speak dialogically as well. I, I have like four pages of notes to get through. But I, I think there's some important interventions here that we have to examine both on the ideological as well as a material basis, right? And so when we look at what the, the scholarship is doing in terms of theory, in terms of research, and I'm getting into how it plays out on, on kind of like the everyday uh, lived experience, is, is that it's reorienting anti-Blackness within colonial logics, right? But it's also excavating the role of racial capitalism, accumulation, uh, and gender racism within this context. And so when we look at this work, they're, they're appreh we're apprehending these anti-Black ideas and technologies within their multi-directional current. So there's a a south-north, north-south move here that's happening here and it's multi-directional. And that undoes the static way in which we've come to understand what it means to be Latinx, right? Or, or Latin American. It's undoing these static uh, racial formations. In doing so, there's the centering of, of Black Latinx and, and, and Afro-Latin American experiences uh, to counter the erasure of blackness within these monolithic constructions of Latinidad. And when we look at this body of work, this is done both historically as well as hemispherically, because they're, I'm sorry, as well as contemporarily. Those are important connections to make there. Um, and so think about these discussions and discourses of mestizaje, um, of racial democracy, right? And the ways in which they show up in political contestations, the ways in which they show up in theories, right? So as someone who does a lot of critical race theory work, when you read a lot of a, a lat crit work, not all of it, because there's some scholars who push back on it, but there's some lat crit work that can, that can privilege these, these discourses and narratives of mestizaje and racial democracy um, in an effort to trouble the black white binary, so to say. Um, and, and in doing so, what it does is it doesn't position Latinidad as adjacent to Blackness, right? It centers Blackness within our understandings of Latinidad, both in the U.S., 
um, as well as uh, across the Americas. And we also have to be clear too that Latinidad has a, a, a US based construction. So I have to be clear that in saying across the Americas, we got to recognize the limits of how Latinidad is constructed. Um, on a material level, this research and, and these theories are capturing the material impacts of anti-blackness that are tangible, the things that we can see, the things that we live. Um, and not only does this, this push back on these discourses uh, of, of anti-blackness um, in the US and Latin America that can be, that can be considered as less benign, um, I was reading recently um, uh, an article in Latino Rebels by William Garcia. I encourage everyone to read it where he points out this idea that we have to look at structural racism as it pertains, as it pertains to uh, anti-blackness in the Latinx community, right? We have to position this within the structural and we also have to get at white racial dominance because oftentimes when we talk about theorizing uh, uh, Latinidad, when we talk about uh, theorizing anti-blackness within U.S. Latinx communities as well as across the diaspora, we have to name the oppressor, right? And sometimes that is obscured um, in these conversations. And so it gives that the, the, this idea of white racial dominance. And what this does is it allows us to see the afterlife of slavery, right, across the African diaspora in the Americas, and I'm, and I'm quoting Hartman here, which are those skewed, life those skewed life chances, the limited access to health and education, uh, premature death, incarceration, impoverishment. So we have to look at those, those, those ways in which the afterlife of slavery is lived out for US Black Latin Nexus, um, as well as for Afro-Latin Americans across the Americas. Um, so what we're able to do, I think, is, is, is see this ongoing legacy of conquest. But when I think about this from an educational perspective, because I know many of us in here uh, today are educators, this forces us to, to ask some questions and perhaps engage with some uncomfortable questions as well, right? And so some of the conversations that I've been having with colleagues are, how is it that we have HSIs and we have PWIs that are becoming HSIs, but the, the population is becoming less black and more white. So how does all of this happen at the same time? Um, again, as, as a K-12 educator, um, I've had the experience of having to advocate for students, right? Where my black Latinx students were being pushed into special education programs as opposed to AP, IB, um, and all of these advanced level programs that put them on the path, for example, to higher education. Um, and so the ways in which their flesh, all right, I, I'm not even talking body, but the ways in which their flesh um, is read becomes important in this case. Again, I'm gonna refer to the, the research of, of Jasmine Haywood and Amalia Adache who talk about um, the Afro-Latinx experience on college campuses. Um, and when you look at, let's take, for example, my university, La Casita, um, the, the Institute of Hispanic Latino Culture, and the ways in which spaces are cultivated, or rather not cultivated for Afro-Latinx students on college campuses, right? And there's this, this, this in-between. And so that triple consciousness, that theory of triple consciousness that Juan Flores and and uh, Miriam Jimenez Ramon talk about that in betweenness, the in betweenness of being Black, Latinx, and American. It, it, it emerges in these types of contexts. And so I welcome uh, any conversations around any of the theoretical or research based provocations I provide, and I'll turn it over to my colleague. Thanks, Dr. Busey. Um, yeah, where, where to begin in about five to 10 minutes, to be very honest. Um, I am gonna talk a little bit about critical race theory in particular, as it relates to a tool for being able to uncover or unearth these structures that are at play, in particular uh, structures of racism and anti-blackness that have been baked in, right, have been embedded, not only within the systems that we work in and live in, but also in how we understand uh, what we see and what we view in the world. 
Um, but I want to uh, connect back since uh, Dr. Busey talked about uh, Hispanic serving institutions or predominantly white institutions, PWIs, uh, becoming or moving towards Hispanic serving institutions. And I saw some comments go off in the chat about, you know, if even though the enrollment of uh, Latinx is in uh, college in, at colleges is increasing, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're being served equitably. Um, and you can see this also, not just within the Latinx, but even more so, um, critical race theory, which states that, simply put, race pervades every aspect of society. Right? Critical race theory just means that everything you see, like the Lion King, right? Everything the light touches is yours, right? Everything, everything the light touches, and even the darkness, is connected and has been impacted by race and racism. Um, and as such, um, there's some tenants that uh, Dixon and Russo, um, 2006, I know some people are looking for, for articles, Dixon and Russo, 2006, uh, specifically uh, talk about eight different tenants within critical race theory, but the two that I'd like to focus on because I think they, uh, they are part of the, the structures of, of higher education um, and even amplified, at least in the work that, I've, that I do and see is, uh, one of them is interest convergence, right? And all that means, interest convergence, that just means that the interest of, of people of color, specifically the interest of black people, now align just enough with the interests of white people that now it's okay to, to do whatever we need to do about it. So for example, um, what I've seen in, in my practice, whether I've served on hiring committees or served as a liaison to make sure that the questions from a, a, a research program are actually equitable and, and inclusive, what I've noticed is that Latinx individuals are utilized as a battle tool against Black individuals, enrolling in programs, um, being selected for, for jobs, as well as enrollment, because the institution itself and institutions themselves, not just higher education, but where we work, um, where we go to church, right, all these different places can actually use it to say, okay, well, we need to be more quote unquote diverse or equitable. And as such, let's show you all the Latinx names that we have on this paper, right? Like, let me show you how every year consistently the enrollment of Latinx individuals has increased every year since, I don't know, let's pick a 2016, right? And in that case, and this is hypothetical, we're not talking about any institution that any of us work at, um, is that they can say they are being more diverse, right? Institutions can say they are in fact being more diverse because they are increasing the amount of Latinxes in schools. However, if you look right next door to our community, our black brothers and sisters, what's happening is that there's a huge decrease of students, of black students who are being admitted. Not that they're not applying, but they're not being admitted. And also, it is also because they might not be enrolling because it takes 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour to walk across campus to see anybody that looks like you. So I, I say this as an example because it is, when I use theory, in particular critical race theory, it helps me make sense of what's been going on and not chalk it up to simply, oh, I guess that's just the way it is. Um, I didn't understand what I was going through as a Latinx first generation college student going through my undergrad and then into my master's program as the only person of color in my cohort, I thought it was just because I was not smart enough as everybody else until, until I learned about theory, particularly critical race theory, to help me unpack that what I was feeling and experiencing wasn't just because I was one of the few or only one. So I want to use this as a tool. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about was um, this role of, of anti-racism, and I know Carolina gave a wonderful definition of anti-racism, and Dr. Ibram Kendi, who used to be at the University of Florida, and I was at American University, I believe, um, really does highlight, um, even though I'm not sure if people are saying anti-racism is a theory yet, I use it as a lens um, because it, it helps. Um, but what I will say is that um, there is a huge difference to echo and to uplift what Carolina said between saying I'm not racist and saying I'm anti-racist because if we consider ourselves to be not racist, however, still live in a society, benefit from these structures that have been established as anti-Black, we therefore are complicit, right? We are just living in the life um, that is continuously 
burdening people, burdening specifically black people and black communities. So that is something that's really important to understand because that's something I talk with my students all the time about, whether my students are black students, uh, Latinx students, right? Uh, white students, you name it. We all have this conversation about, well, I'm not racist or I didn't make this structure. So how is this my fault? Right, we are asking for people to understand that when you are not working against a racist structure, you are complicit. And so that is something that in, specifically in the Latinx community is a really hard thing to talk about. Not just for those of us who might be nodding our head or who have read some of these articles who are looking for more tools because you are already doing the work. Thank you for doing that work, right? This is, this is hard work, right? This is dirty work. There's no way to not be, uh, Right, to not have aches and pains and dirt when we are doing this work. However, the challenge is when we think about how we have been, it's been ingrained in us, right? So there's an element of unlearning that I told you I had to do a lot of unlearning coming from the state that Juneteenth is specifically focused on, right? Texas. Right. Um, I had to do a lot of unlearning about stuff that I didn't even know was a quote unquote thing until I left Texas, um, even though I love it, love Texas. Um, is specifically thinking about how we communities, marginalized communities, and specifically uh, Black and Latinx communities have been pitted against each other for the small amount of resources like this, right? Like there's all these resources over here and we have this much. And we're told that you have to fend for your resources against each other. So that specifically, because it's been ingrained, has contributed even further to the way that we do things without even knowing that they actually are harmful, right, and, and deadly to, to Black communities. And so that's something really important to, to, to grasp onto. Um, and sometimes, sometimes it's unwilling or unknowing, but oftentimes it's willingness, right? Uh, I quoted this as willfully ignorant, right? Knowing that if I actually have to engage in a conversation or, for example, um, I have family members who I know that this topic is something that there's not a winner or a loser. It's just, we're going to say what we got to say. And even though people might know um, what I'm talking about in my family, and I've made the connections to help them think about their, their role in this, this sort of like, well, I didn't hear it, right? When you leave the house, when you go back to where you live, we don't have to listen to you talking about it anymore. And I know that, right? And that's the reality, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to stop talking or stop respectfully, right, respectfully correcting my mom, right, if there's something that happens or, you know, whoever it is. Um, but the, going back to the concept of pitting each other against one another, um, this has been talked about in many scholars um, and, and in many communities, right? So Dr. Busey talked about, it's not just academics, right, people with any sort of degrees that have the knowledge, but communities of color, black communities have been talking about this forever, right? This isn't new. Um, but Audre Lorde talks about this no hierarchy of oppression, right? It, and talks about we are not to say, um, yes, Black Lives Matter. And it's also important, don't forget, I'm struggling over here too because I'm brown. That is also, think we, that's also playing into this, oh, well, let's, let's weigh out oppressions to see which oppression is heavier today. Right? Like that doesn't make a winner for anybody, right? There's no hierarchy in oppression. Right, to rate oppression is actually going and putting more oppression on the people who don't have a voice in the game to begin with. So again, I, I'm, I'm going to be done right now, but I wanted to review on um, No Hierarchy of Oppression by Audre Lorde. Um, that is a seminal piece that I think really helps to recenter um, blackness in particular, thinking about how we have been ingrained to fight for the smaller amount of resources that has been given to us. Um, and then also thinking about critical race theory, which is Delgado and Stelfonsic, 2001. Um, however, if you wanna learn a little bit more about the tenants, in particular, interest convergence, which just means that I'm only gonna get what I get when the white group over there is like, okay, cool, right? If we say yes to this, then it'll make us look good. Like a lot of diversity, equity, and inclusion things that are happening right now at universities. Um, then we'll go ahead and let you pre present what you always were trying to present or train, um, you know, faculty or students or staff. So interest convergence, that's Dr. Dixon um, and Russo, 2006. I just wanted to provide 
quotes. I'm also an academic who writes, <laughs> writes a lot, so you're getting my reference list right now. But thank you. Thank you. Um, I definitely wanted to um, kind of help in the com as we continue this conversation and, and apply it more into the higher education lens because, you know, as you can imagine, with this um, program being hosted by two higher education organizations and having, um, having all of us be in the higher education field in different ways, I'd love to share more insight, especially when it comes to what Black and Black Latinx, um, you know, staff face, you know, within the student affairs field in general, uh, where I am. Um, before I continue doing that, I definitely want to also echo, um, you know, what Dr. Busey and Dr. Cece and, you know, and, and Carolina have continued to mention of kind of elevating work that is already out there when it comes to anti-Blackness and specifically anti-Blackness in higher education. Um, definitely an appreciation for, you know, the Black Latinos Know Collective and, you know, the work of um, Dr. Haywood. Um, you know, that I have, I, you know, I'll, I'll refer to a bit, you know, because even through, because once again, like it was mentioned earlier, we're all coming from our own individual experiences and, and our own individual lens, but I hope that this continues to help all of you in, the, in, in, this, um, in, in this conversation to not leave the conversation right here in this virtual Zoom space, but rather continue to um, learn and unlearn. Uh, yourselves. So, you know, I'm happy to share um, as many resources as I can um, as part of the notes that will be shared after. Um, but I also, you know, would love to share more about what it, what it's like to some to experience all this as a Black Latino in higher education. Something that is a mixture of, you know, and as we see not only for ourselves as professionals, but also for our students, a combination of, you know, not only lived experiences before coming into college campuses, you know, which, you know, but then also the different types of institutions that they attend. So whether a, uh, a student is attending a PWI or an HBCU or an HSI, like it was mentioned before, the notion of whether they're attending a public or private, that all, that all matters. Uh, and that's something that is uh, important to recognize. Um, for me, as I, as I navigate being in the field and being in a, a being in a position in a role that is in not necessarily centering race by nature is something where I have to bring my own experiences and my own identities as a way to help me to center to center it, you know, and especially when supporting black students uh, and supporting, you know, and, and helping students who are not black to kind of apply the work in the in in unlearn through it. So, you know, I, what comes to mind is being able to go to a, having the privilege of attending, uh, you know, an institution like University of Miami or, you know, in general, just the privilege that comes from being college educated and, you know, and being able to use that again as another, as another way to position myself to be able to support students as they navigate through their own blackness and their own identity. Um, so, let me pull up a few things. As I mentioned earlier, uh, when when everything when I started, and when I started working at the at, at University of South Carolina, that was my first role within the within the higher education field after after attending graduate school, and it happened during a time when the when you think about what happened in 2014 through 2017 the start of the Black Lives Matter movement and the, you know, and what happened in Charleston, South Carolina, which we commemorated a few days ago. So it speaks to the way in which blackness sometimes is explored from a racial trauma lens of experience of, of dealing of not only seeing those things as a black uh, professional in the field, but also helping and supporting our students through the same thing of being able to support them as they see what we currently see, uh, you know, on on our screens, and it's important to uh, be able to to recognize that sometimes our own our own way in which we find our own blackness comes from a space of, unfortunately, a space of racial trauma. Uh, so we have to definitely be cognizant of that as we, you know, and we have to take a take take a moment to be able to. Up to apply that work into being able to support students. Um, 
when I take it specifically into civic engagement spaces, for example, I see uh, an importance in being able to specify civic engagement and target it to be able to better work with students of color who maybe are seeing voter registration efforts or census efforts and are not seeing them in the same way as maybe their white peers have been of being able to address topics like voter suppression and being able to address topics like the fact that black and Latinx populations are some of the um, are some of the um, more harder to count populations. So when I uh, dove into the work and being able to um, do so in a way that is not only helping to address the needs for all students at an institution, but rather be very intentional about the students of color at an institution, especially black students, is something that is very important and meaningful. And it comes from that lens, uh, that, I ha that personal lens of being able to be real with the, my own sense of navigating through my own blackness um, and being able to have that sense of vulnerability and authenticity among my students to be able to support them as they do the same. You know, and especially when you think about black Latinx students in college spaces who maybe are feeling like anti-blackness is coming from their own, the, the very spaces in which they try and get involved in like Latin American student organizations or you know, or even within the Black Student Unions themselves of being, not feeling like they're able to um, be a part of one or the other or not feeling like they can fully be part of, of both. Um, so I know I'm, I'm mentioning a, a lot of different concepts and I, and I hope that the conversation continues. And absolutely, I just saw on the chat mentioning undocumented Black Latinx students because that's another very important piece of recognizing that oftentimes when people are speaking on supporting undocumented students, when it comes to students who are black and undocumented, that is not the first picture that comes to mind, um, or at least not to mind naturally. So I think that's something very important to mention. And once again, I think um, it all comes from whatever spaces our students are, are coming from before attending high, uh, higher education institutions, whether they are they grew up in areas where they were more um, connected to black American folks and, you know, or unfortunately being in spaces where families are once again deny, denying blackness within the Latinx community because to them, black people are the folks who are not, are not Latino, outside of, outside of Latinidad. So, um, that's something very important to name and to, and to keep in mind as well, because that is one more thing that is taking into the into the fold and into what they ex what they experience and the way in which they then apply that into the experience towards college students and college populations. Um, and once again, like I said, it's different from from one type of institution to another. So, for example, I have have not attended or have not worked at an HBCU. Um, but it's important to recognize also work that is that exists to be able to apply that to support Latinx students who are in uh, historically black colleges and universities. For example, I know of a program called HBCU Palante, which is put together by Dr. Canela Una Martina Costa Eatman, um, uh, somebody that I um, got to know and met during my time in college, and now. Seeing that, seeing that work elevated um, is something that is important for students who are starting to go to HBC, Latinx students who are starting to go to historically black colleges and universities. Back to the political engagement scene, like one of the articles that Dr. Haywood wrote was about anti-black Latin, Latino racism in an era of Trumpismo. So the connections between anti-black Latino racism and the way, the way in which that informs political ideologies and the way in which in the way in which people lean politically. And that's something that I have to then keep in mind when it comes to helping to coordinate and to oversee political engagement on campus. Um, because once again, hosting a program like a Constitution Day or a voter registration drive will look very different for some of my white students than for some of my black, by our, our black students, especially when you think of voter suppression 
or it might look different for folks who are undocumented because clearly they are unable to register to vote. So how do we, how do we engage those populations in a very intentional way um, is something that is constantly in my mind. Um, and especially as, you know, one of, you know, as, um, as one of the few, um, if not, I think the only black Latino on campus, um, you know, and I think it was a similar situation in my previous institution, but um, I think it's very, very important to keep those things in mind, especially for, for black staff and black faculty who are not necessary, who are applying are part of the work in higher education in other in, in different ways that are not necessarily working for center, for multicultural affairs offices or necessarily applying their their academic work towards areas that are that are not are, are not necessarily immediately connected to race um, so I think that is um, something very important to highlight and you know with that I'd love to uh, also elevate our my you know black um, you know whether it's black American or black Latino or afro Latino folks who maybe have similar ex different experiences in their own institutions um, you know I want to give you the agency and you know the can I empower you feel free to use the chat to share some of your own experiences of being being black in the field I remember I know a few days ago uh, mm -hmm. there was a Twitter hashtag that was all about you know some of the experiences that our um, that our black colleagues face in higher education institutions, which is um, very important to keep in mind. While folks add things to the chat, some things I wanted to add to Luisa's commentary about higher ed and student affairs from a personal and anecdotal perspective is remembering, I think younger folks are coming into an awakening that perhaps their predecessors, ancestors, and older generations haven't when it comes to reclaiming their blackness. And so with that, I've noticed a lot of loneliness when it comes to exploring this identity for myself, my students, because in one hand, like Luis mentioned, they have to validate their existence and experience at the Latinx Cultural Center. They also have to do that at the Black Cultural Center. And then when we're talking about their communities at home, like their family members, friends, high schoolers, et cetera, they have to combat that anti-Blackness and notions of erasing Blackness within our families. Yes. Um, yes. They don't have anybody, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes, they don't have anybody to talk to about it at that point, unless there are staff, faculty doing this work actively. And so a call to action that my director and I have really been, I'm, I guess I'm very appreciative of my director being able to kind of put this mentality into our students and myself as well, is that Latinx cultural centers can also do black programming. It doesn't always have to be the black cultural center leading that work because we do have black students in our communities and it doesn't always have to even be in collaboration. Like, yes, beautiful collaborations happen and we should collaborate. And if the Black Culture Center is taxed out because of all the work that is going on already, it's okay for you to lead that Latinx Cultural Center work and center Blackness and then engage your non-Black students of why that makes you feel uncomfortable. And on that same light, understanding that especially with everything that's happening right now, it should not be just the role of the student diversity or multicultural offices to engage in, in this anti-racism work. In fact, for it to continue and to truly make an impact in our institutions, it needs to happen at every single level from the math department all the way to the library and to offices like the one where I'm at, you know, in civic engagement spaces where, you know, to, to really take a hard look at all this and be, and, and be realistic so that we don't, it, so it doesn't come across as the fact that as the unfortunate taxing that you know those offices then have um and in supporting black colleagues that work outside of um that really outside of what's known as diversity offices that continue doing the work without making the the assumption that oh they must be doing anti-racist work because they work for that office absolutely yeah, i've had passing circumstances where even though i've worked at leadership and service offices in civic engagement spaces during almost my entire time in higher education, I've, you know, other, co you know, colleagues in an institution would make the wrong assumption that I work, oh, you work at the diversity office on campus. And that's something that I've heard happens, has happened to other um, fellow black professionals. So I kind of want to um, speak the truth to that um, for, um, and especially, you know, in hoping that we continue to elevate and center the voices of our, of our black um, faculty and staff and students. I also want to add to the conversation um, as well. 
especially we're, we're in a moment where I think what we're going to see, because right now campuses are spared with most of the students being home during this moment, right? But once students return and then the demand start to ramp up even more, become more visible on university campuses, I think we're going to see, um, I think we're going to see some more demands made. And, and oftentimes we, we see demands about hiring black faculty. And I think it's important to make demands about hiring black Latinx faculty as well, right? So when you look at like these departments of Latino studies, Latin American studies, and you look at the makeup of these departments in terms of faculty demographics, you have a lot of white Latinxes and a lot of white Latin Americans who teach in these departments. Um, and therefore there's a lot of epistemic genocide happening there where mm -hmm. um, students aren't learning about um, Afro-Latini that, where students aren't learning about black social movements across the Americas. Uh, where students aren't learning about Afro-Latin American feminisms, right? And so the cultural centers that often have a connection to these departments then perpetuate even more whiteness um, and, and white racial dominance. So I think it's important to address that as well. Um, I think another thing that we're seeing, and I saw it come up in the comments as well, is in talking about the Black Caribbean and talking about Jamaica and talking about Haiti as well. Um, I've been in these conversations where the university is giving out um, grants to go do research in um, Latin America or do US, US based research. And, you know, there are people out there who think, well, there's no interest in, in, in Haitian studies or Black Caribbean studies, but it gets pushed out um, of these academic departments like Latin American and, and, and Latino studies. And so I think it's important that we address this on all levels of. of of the structural basis of the university from hiring to the formation of curricular programming and student programming and so on. Something I wanna to add to that, that I've had to challenge myself as I do this work, guess I identify as Afro-Latina and I'm Puerto Rican. And I recognize that a lot of the times the Black Latinx and Afro-Latinx experience is very Caribbean centered. Um, and so I do want to acknowledge that we have also have to push the, the conversation to include South America and to include um, Central America, which is a whole other conversation that I'm also working through, right, of like how often Central Americans are forgotten within Latinidad to begin with. Mm -hmm. And that also means that we have to acknowledge the Black communities that exist in there. Absolutely. I've had students who uh, say that the immediate you know, assumption that is made as, as, that, as far as their, where their Afro-Latinidad comes from is that it comes from the the Afro -Carib the Caribbean countries like Cuba, Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, etc. Yeah. Uh, without completely forgetting that places like Panama, Colombia, Mexico yeah. have their own. The Garifunas in um, Garifunas in Honduras, yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Brazil, also another conversation of Latin America yeah. and who gets forgotten because they don't speak Spanish. See, more names being mentioned, more, more countries being mentioned in the chat right now uh, because it's important to keep that, it's important to recognize that. And, and I want to acknowledge, I have to say that as a faculty member, the space is similar but different in how, in how it functions. And so um, I appreciate people calling, calling out, and like it, it can't just be student affairs professionals, right? People who are in the practice and praxis every single day, right? From even though it says 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., I used to be a student affairs, right? Like it is 8 a.m. to whenever you- Sunrise to sunset done, and beyond. Whenever you're done. Right, like I used to work in residence life, shout out to Delmi, NYU, um, and Miami, Ohio. And in those spaces, right, that was different. People, it felt like we were our own continent and then faculty sort of did their own thing, right? Now as faculty, I can see, again, going back, I'm the structure person, right? The theory person. I can see how these structures have been put into place that don't allow for a collaborative effort or it's not that they don't allow, but it's that it's been ingrained that our job is the classroom, right? We're, we, have, we have content to give, and this is what we're gonna give, and that's it, right? And, and that is the challenge because it's also, I'm looking at the chat and I'm thinking, I know, every, I know people are doing this hard work, right? I, with what you are talking about, the examples you're giving, the love that you're sharing with each other just via text, um, I know that you are doing this hard work. And so that is not to also, right? I'm, I'm calling us out, I'm calling me as faculty out to say like, it has to be, um, top down, up down, middle approach, right? Like all these different things because um, 
faculty are, are complicit, right? We are complicit if we are not speaking about anti-blackness in the classroom. Um, and I wanted to, to just offer up some, some easy ways to think, easy ways to think about how do we recenter blackness in classrooms? I know that there was some questions submitted about um, how do we do programming around anti-blackness or, or programming that centers blackness if we don't identify as black? Um, one of the easy things is to just cite black authors, right? Cite black people in your work, right? Like cite black, <laughs> cite black women, right? Like the people I, the people we put up in, in the chat, uh, right? Dixon, um, Audre Lorde, black women, right? Like, black people have written stuff. Black people are smart, right? They have the knowledge, right? It is out there. So if you, you, even if you use that as a tool for the next meeting that you're going to be in, because you know you're going to be in a meeting where someone's going to say, um, well, I don't really know who was the authors of this, or I don't know if people wrote about that. Okay, right? Like, let me, let me tell you all these different things about people who wrote who are Black. So it, the really the first easy, easy step, do some self-education on thinking about some authors, right? We offered up some, but, but all of you have offered up lots of others to each other and cite black authors, right? When you are creating classes, um, when you are involved in freshman experience opportunities, right? Cite black people who have helped create those support mechanisms um, that we offer to students and or that we offer to staff or faculty for trainings about how to unpack their identity or understand who they are. Um, the other thing that I would say is to be very honest with, with, with students. For me, mm -hmm. I I teach a, an array of, of students, right? So it's not just black students, it's not just Latinx or marginalized communities. Actually, I teach a good number of students who have no clue that they have a race and have no clue how they are complicit to the racial structures that be. Now, I know some of you are like, no, 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 they have a clue, right? They know what they're doing. And I acknowledge that there are some who totally do, but there's a lot who have no clue about what this looks like because they grew up and they still live in the same community that they've lived in since before they were born, right? The same people who are living next to them are the same people who are at their mom's baby shower, right? They, they don't know anybody else but the people they grew up with. So also thinking about that for students is it's a small, it's a slow and steady process in, in my opinion, right? We know this that even though all the work that people have been calling on us to do for DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. They want us to fix it this week or by next week, right? Yeah. But like, that's not gonna happen because this has been around since the existence of the country, right? The existence of even before the United States. So thinking about that slow and steady is really important, right? Identity development at the heart is where I start um, and helping people understand who they are to then move into understanding like how those identities impact the spaces that they move in. Right, impact the spaces that they live in, impact other people. But the challenge is that people want us to do it quick and fast um, to get things out of the way. Right. So I would I two tools I want to offer up, cite black people. Right. Like that is one of the easiest ways to show somebody without even having to say it that you support black education, right? That you support and uplift black knowledge um, as knowledge creators. And then the second one is to call people out when they want you to do something that is too fast, um, right? Like I was given five minutes um, two days ago to talk about diversity, specifically anti-racism. Um, and the only reason I said, okay, was because I'm having a workshop next week. And I was like, if you want to know more, come to my workshop, right? But other than that, it was, it's challenging because they want you to do everything really quickly. So feel free, right, by, to embrace that agency, self-agency, and say, you're not going to do it quick. Because when we do things quick, the people who are often forgotten are the ones who are most marginalized, which goes back to Black communities, right? They want us to talk fast, so that way they can give us, get the basics, um, and also not feel so bad about it. So I would like to offer those two things up, just for practitioners or people who are building workshops or programs. I would also add to that, I want to give, love my academic scholars because I think it makes the work possible and also want to recognize that non-academic work is happening too. And so recognizing the labor that our artists do, our healers do, our community organizers, nonprofits, um, media, beauty, all of these people, especially right now, if you just go on Instagram and put Afro Latinx like popping off on conversation, hosting live, 
Instagrams, et cetera. So there's like really tangible information that's happening. And those may be some of the sources that we want to consider when we're thinking about how do we talk to our families about this. I think some of these people do a really good job making this conversation day to day, tangible, digestible and relatable in ways that doesn't feel so elite and academic and intimidating that people can be like, okay, never mind, I don't know the terminology you're using, so I'm going to check out now. And so I just want to give a huge shout out to those people and consider bringing those people to your campuses, especially if we're still in this COVID world of Zoom. Now it's even hopefully easier for you to invite speakers and bring these voices to your students or your faculty or your staff, because we're here right now with all of you from all over the country, perhaps the world. Mm -hmm. And so think about making sure that those voices are a part of your academic and co-curricular experiences. And more specifically, I'd love to appreciate the Black women who have been spearheading so much of this work. Um, but with, within the entire diaspora, but, you know, Black Latinas, Afro-Latinas, and also, you know, Black women, Black, you know, within the entire diaspora, both within the United States and beyond. Because much of what I see, for example, when I Google resources about Afro-Latinx identity, most of it is curated and created by Black women. Okay. And that's something that I definitely wanna, want to put out there and acknowledge and appreciate. Um, because you know a lot of you know in a lot of the a lot of this academic work it definitely gives validity to the lived experiences that we have both as practitioners but also the experiences that our students have so that we are then better able to to live authentically and empower our students to do the same um, you know like like dr. Cece mentioned that's how that's important and I, I oftentimes say because something something that was told to me in, in the past is vulnerability unlocks relationships and I'm very big on the relationship building and for, for me to do that, you know, that authenticity needs to happen. But I also recognize that sometimes that authenticity can come from, a, from very painful places. So I also take that space to appreciate the healers and the folks who are using even something as, as simple as music. Like I was telling the panelists when we we're getting ready, I searched on Apple Music, uh, Musica Negra, and there's actually um, a radio station that's, that's called Musica Negra through, uh, you know, I'll, sh I'll drop the link later, you know, like something, you know, and, and then you wonder um, what jobs are deemed essential or not in the age of COVID, but that's another conversation, but yeah. I guess I want to echo again, Dr. Cece's point that this is not going to happen overnight because I also recognize we're like 10 minutes to, to close. Um, and so really, I think a lot of times we can't sit still. We can't sit in the discomfort and we feel like if we're like silent, we're not doing enough and we feel like we have to do action. And I wanna recognize that action is also sitting down and reflecting and unlearning and reading, like investing in the time to actually read the things that are being uh, published and hear the voices that are speaking on this, especially if they identify with the black experience in any way and having a diverse perspective on that too. because. I recognize my privilege as a Puerto Rican person. My narrative is pretty spread out there when it comes to the Afro-Latinx experience or Latinidad in general in the United States. It's usually Mexicans and Puerto Ricans. And so just really want to echo that, like this is once again, one of the many starts that we're doing and how do we move this conversation forward into action? Because I think a few of us are just tired of talking about it. I mean, I love talking about it and we need to like, you know, do a little dance or something with it. Yeah, I would say, um, I just want to, I'm very thankful for this space. You know, I smudged my office with Sage before we started and I was really, really focused and was, and was hopeful seeing his, yes. Um, but was just, I'm, I'm really thankful for the space to be able to connect. Um, and, and I only know my experience, I'm an expert of what I know, but I think the important thing that I would like to highlight is I urge you to not be okay with being utilized as the tool, right, for anti-blackness. So sometimes we don't know, like, our role because we are hardworking, right, like, on the ground, ready to go. Um, and as Latinx individuals, we are proud and we are okay to say, right, we started from the bottom, now we're here for some of us. And that is a good thing. And there's oftentimes where institutions, right, because they, they are the ivory tower, right? They're called the ivory yes. tower for a reason. They're not called the black tower, the brown tower, the colored tower, right? They are the ivory tower for a reason. They have put people in places to ensure that we are, again, going back to um, like working against each other, right? We, have, we are working against each other because we're saying, oh, well, Dr. Suarez, don't you want to be, you know, involved in this really important project? And you know, since you're already on it, we'll just ask you to join this one too. And part of it is one, right? That is the 
the POC, people of color tax, right? And even more so the black tax because there's extra things added to, to black administrators, black faculty, black staff um, who do diversity and also live diversity, equity and inclusion. Um, but then also being in the know, I can say actually there is somebody else, right? A black scholar, a black community member who is already doing this work, who's been doing this work. I think that they also need to be included in this work. So that way it's not just the brown woman who may scare them a little bit, but don't make them feel super uncomfortable when they're talking about race because I'm not black. So also just validating yourself, knowing that, yes, you might be in a good position or you're thankful for the job that you have, but they didn't give it to you just because they thought you need, you, you should deserve, you, you should have it. You have it because you earned it, right? You deserved it. And as such, making sure that we offer up those opportunities to our black colleagues and our black um, community members when they are being not invited to that table um, because they already have that person of color at that table. So like, we don't need a black person at the table. Right. So just being mindful of those really secretive ways that um, another tenant of critical race theory, right? Whiteness is property that like people are keeping things by themselves. Mm -hmm. We're like, no, this is my white property. We're gonna give you a little bit because you're not so black and you're a little brown, but being knowledgeable about the fact that that is happening can help us be like, wait a minute, I'm calling on Dr. Busey, right? I'm calling on, I'm, I'm calling on Luis, I'm calling on so-and-so because they need to have a seat at this table as well. Mm -hmm. yes. And when we think of what's currently happening and the way in which our you know, black folks, especially young black people have been responding to, this is beyond George Floyd, um, This, is, but you know, the countless other folks and the upcoming, you know, the way in which the Black Lives Matter continues to rise, we have to absolutely listen and like, as we continue to figure out, hey, wh where can I, where, where can I engage in anti-black, anti-blackness work beyond education, we have to continue to listen to the voices and the work that our black young people are doing out there, whether it's on the streets, whether they are mobilizing voter engagement, whether we're talking about the census, because even I'll quote Ooh. again, uh, you know, the uh, the Black uh, Latinas No Collective, because they said something that I, I think they said it better than I could even say it. In fact, I'm gonna drop it right now. Latinx is when you answer the census race question, be sure to lead with your sense of racial justice. Use your hashtag street race, which is work from Nancy Lopez, not your adonde tu abuela está race. The census is not therapy, but a way to document race based and other social and political inequalities. And that's something that we have to keep in mind. Yeah. Um, there is an episode of NPR's uh, Code Switch, which is a podcast. And that episode went, went in on what Puerto Rico and the census look like. So that's something that I w I'm going to drop that link as well, because I think that helped to provide so much insight that it, I didn't even know as a Puerto Rican about how anti-blackness goes all the way back to the beginning of even the notion of calling our, um, calling ourselves like being a mix of black, white, and Taino is, is erasure in itself of, you know, from the beginning, Puerto Rico being marketed to the United States and outside of the United States as this place where racism doesn't exist. Um, yet um, in the past census that we just had, more, most Puerto Ricans identified as white. So that's something that we have to, you know, we have to recognize because that all that informs how we eventually go into navigating places like higher education spaces as students, as practitioners, et cetera. And that's something that, you know, you know, I, when I, and I acknowledge that struggle that sometimes come with checking off boxes, but it's a matter of being intentional about it. Um, you know, because once again, like it was said, it's, it's, it's a strategy. It's about, you know, once again, how do people see you when you walk down the street? Like in South Carolina, people see my, especially in South Carolina, and I'm sure in many other places, people saw my blackness before I even opened my mouth. And they didn't realize I was Latino mm -hmm. until I opened my mouth and the accent came out. Yeah. An accent that I used to be made fun of back in Miami, growing up in, in you know, growing up in, in public education system in Miami to now being proud of it because I know that it also adds another layer to, um, what blackness looks like. So. Two last things, really quickly. Yes. Another 
a podcast to listen to is by Latino USA. They also did a report on the census in Puerto Rico from somebody who's on the ground reporting it. And shout out to El Colectivo Ile, which was mentioned earlier, because that is the local organization that was really mobilizing Puerto Ricans on the island to acknowledge their blackness and why identifying as such um, matters on the census. Radio Caña Negra is doing an anti-blackness workshop on Saturday. I don't know if Eventbrite is still up or that works, but it'll check it out because again, local organizers are doing this work. And then finally, Latina to Latina podcast also interviewed Rosa Clemente. So if you don't know that name, if you want to know more about Afro-Latinidad, a huge organizer, um, ran for vice president back in 2008, and Dr. Marta Moreno Vega. She's like kind of like Rosa's mentor. Um, so 228, I'm looking at Denny, not sure what's happening. Yes. So I just want to say a quick thank you to our amazing, amazing presenters. I don't know about you, but my heart is definitely full. I am inspired. I am energized. And I hope that you all get something out of this amazing um, panel. I also want to thank everyone who participated for making this a priority in your day and for being here um, because change would only happen if we all in it. Um, so with that, I wanted to share a couple of quick things. Everyone who registered will get an email asking for some follow up questions, including for you to share resources. We are collecting all those resources. We will find a way to get those resources out to everyone. I'm going to ask the panelists if they are okay with social media, please share that in the chat. Otherwise, we will make sure that we share that because that was a big ask. Uh, for those of you um, that we didn't get to answer all of the questions, so I do want to acknowledge we did not get to do that, but we hope this will become a series. So we will keep your questions. We will strategize on how we can utilize social media, our newsletters, um, to again, look at the questions that you raised and continue this conversation. This is the beginning, not the end, of what we hope will be an ongoing conversation in terms of our um, communities. Last but not least, I just want to acknowledge that there are generational differences. There was a lot that came up about talking to family, students, colleagues. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, I just want to say that knowledge is not determined by any of the degrees that we own. Our elders have an enormous amount of knowledge that we could learn from. And our young um, professionals have a lot of learning that we could learn from. So the question is, how do we create spaces where we could engage in conversations in ways that we are being thoughtful, caring, sympathetic? But more than anything, how do we create spaces to be vulnerable? Because these conversations entail a certain amount of risk and vulnerability. How do you create space to still love people even after you've had those vulnerable conversations and to give yourself um, some grace and give other people grace for being where they are? So I want to bring things to closure by saying, again, thank you all so much for being here. Know that you are not alone in whatever aspect of this journey you may be in. And that there is a community that's really committed and invested in continuing this conversation moving forward. This was not an individual effort. This was an effort that came from the membership. We heard voices and we acted upon them. So I just want to acknowledge that, as I said earlier at the beginning, we have a lot of expertise, but we still have a lot to learn. And we look forward to engaging with every single one of you, whether that is through social media, newsletter, join the organizations, follow the organizations if you're able to. And regardless of whether you are a member of an organization or not, your voice matters and we are committed to ensuring that you are being heard. So let us know how we can continue to hear you. So with that, if you could just join me in thanking our amazing, amazing presenters. We are so thankful for all of you. Um, and again, thanks to all the presenter um, people who attended. I will highlight that we had 830 people at one point and the lowest was in the 720 and that was still like five minutes ago. So again, this number is just mind blowing in terms of thinking about how much of a passion there is for this kind of conversation. So I can't wait for what round two will bring. But Let's until go. then, y'all have a wonderful weekend and go on to celebrate today. Um, yeah. Spend some time reflecting and learning as well. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Ciao. Yay. <laughs> oh, so good. We did it. <laughs> we did something. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it is.